Oh, we are on the air. Okay. Well, I'll take a deep breath. Uh, I will call the meeting of Wednesday, J July 13th, 2022, to honor. Would everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I do want to introduce the board members tonight because we have a new member sitting uh, for the, his first public hearing, and that is Mr. Beach. Thank you for uh, volunteering to come on this board for us. Thank and you. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Wood, Ms. Beauvais, and my name is Mr. Ingalls. I'm the chair. We do have the town attorney, and I will file off her name, but I'm going to give it a real good try. Uh, Ms. Rachin. You got it. Perfect. And <laughs> she will be here helping me through any questions that might come up that, that I don't understand as being fairly new to the board. And we have the code officer who is basically speaking for the town on the letters that were written, Miss McCabe. And we have a new, oh, and we have uh, Tammy the planner, Tammy w Bellman. Yep. Sorry, I never call her by her last name, so <laughs> she is also here. And we have a new uh, uh, person taking notes for us tonight, uh, sitting in the corner as well, Shannon. And I forget you, Rogers. Oh, I think I've got through that. Wow, this is good. <laughs> we have no minutes for today. Uh, so, having said that, our main reason for, our only reason for being here tonight is an appeal. And because I'm not, I haven't done many of these, I've tried to lay out some plan here as to exactly how this is going to go and we'll do our best to kind of stick with with what I what I'm anticipating is going to happen or hoping that will happen or now do we have any members on zoom tonight okay um, just when you if you want if, when it's your opportunity to talk if you just let someone know raise your hand or something like that uh, in the past it seems like you're familiar with how this is going to work. We've had people that are not on mute and tend to try to interrupt. If that is the case, we will just mute you from here so that we can conduct the meeting as we need. Uh, and like any time that we have a meeting, uh, please conduct all the questions through the chair. And that, that way I can try to keep some kind of orderly fashion on the meeting. Um, when we get to the discussion phase, like we've done in the past, if you raise your hand or something like that, or I know you want to speak, it's certainly going to be fine. So uh, what um, this board obviously is here to uh, try to address come to some understanding of any concerns that someone might have uh, with an action by the code office or the town that they feel is in violation of the ordinance. That's, that's why we're here tonight. Uh, so what we as a board are need, need to do is, is hear proof. We aren't here to investigate anything we just, when you're asked you, to come up and there's a concern, just try to address what your concern is so that we can understand and we'll ask questions so that you can prove to us that there has been a violation of some sort um, in the town. Okay. So the next thing we're going to, once we open the hearing, we have to understand if the what's been addressed by the applicant mr Aldaraji. Aldaraji, is 
something that we can act on. So we will be probably asking the lawyer, uh, Ms. Ranchin, here if it's something that she feels we have the authority to even hear. Um, so that's going to be one of the pieces as we open the hearing, just so that people are, that the board can understand where where we're at and, and what what our next step is. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I might just put a yes. round that out, you're exactly right. Um, before we get into the merits of any kind of appeal, there are three kind of threshold issues that we need to determine. One is standing, meaning that the applicant or appellant coming before you has essentially standing or the right to be here in the first place, right? The second piece, of course, is that you need to determine that this board has jurisdiction over it, and that's exactly what you were talking about. The reason being is that all municipal boards are essentially, and I'm quoting case law here, creatures of statute, which means they can only exercise the authority that they're specifically allowed to by state law or your own ordinance. So you've got to determine, hey, is this something over which we have jurisdiction? And um, you know, the third thing, is, which is the easy one, is the timeliness, right? So if it's not timely, if your ordinance doesn't allow you to hear it, or the applicant doesn't have standing, then you don't get into the merits. So those are the first three threshold issues that you get into, and then um, you, you go from there. Right. Very good. Thank you. So, and if uh, page 120 in our ordinance, if you, as we're starting to de deliberate and understand whether we have standing, that's where our authority comes from. So I just kind of, I know you probably all are aware of that, but if especially with Mr. Beach being new to the board, I tried to put down pages so that when I'm referring to something, we can get all get to where I'm at when I'm trying to talk uh, about anything. Does the board have any questions, not about the hearing, about what I've said and how we pl I plan to proceed? Uh, if we don't, we'll open the hearing and then we'll start during the process. I just was trying to clarify and get a, a sense of where where we're at okay okay so that was my introduction i can flip this over Mr. Chair. yes i have just uh one question i assume that um the appellant understands that they have the burden of proof right that's that's and uh the burden of proof uh, has to be backed up with uh evidence and evidence can be anything from uh, eyewitnesses, videos, letters, emails, but opinions are not evidence. Is that correct? I would agree with you. Okay. Okay, having said that, I am going to open the hearing for Mr. Alja Dejari. And it's on the application dated 6-2-22. Now before, typically, um, we'd ask Mr. Al Dejari as the applicant to be the first one to come up and speak, and, and you will be the first one. I just want to kind of break down now that the hearing's in session. Um, I've decided, and I, I think for the, to hopefully less confusion, that we will take each individual concern, I believe there's two that you, would, that you addressed, separately so that we don't mix up anything that we're talking about that way we can have our questions and whatever whatever the first issue and then we'll move on to the second issue is that <clears throat> going to be okay with everybody Good plan. okay having said that i believe my feeling is i want to start with item 11 on the application because it seems like that one is less going to be less involved than the first one. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think it, it seems like it's going to be less confusing. So we can get, I don't mean to get it out of the way, but we get that one resolved or get that one, some understanding on that one. Uh, and then we'll move to the second one about the subdivision. Okay. And the first one is the question of the well let me go to it's the letter dated 
May 25th, 2022, about the subsurface wastewater disposal system. So that would be in your packet. Um, Mr. Chairman, yes. if I might, I'm sorry. Am I? No, I think just um, on the, the note that we were talking about before about this jurisdictional issue, before we get into the substance yes. of the merits of this case, I think you might want to hit the timeliness, your jurisdiction, not personally, but of the board to hear it, and also standing. Because if e any of those things are not found to be met, then you don't get into the merits. So That's what, I, I was going to actually do that in separately, so I'm glad you brought that up. So on, the, on item 11, that's the first thing that um, I wanted to discuss. And that is the question of standing, like uh, Mr. Ms. Rasheen said. I know that, and I'm going to let Ms. Rasheen speak to, I had some initial concerns about the uh, Supreme Court case, or the su Superior Court, I'm sorry, case. And I believe I'll let her speak to it, but she doesn't feel like that has any bearing on the decision that we're going to make on this. Is, is that, am I speaking correctly on that? I may be missing a beat. When you're speaking about a superior court case, I'm not sure. Oh, oh, there, it was referenced in the material. Yeah, it was just referenced in there. And yes. the question is, do we want to be acting on something if it's in front of superior court? Yeah, I, I think that what this board is limited to is the appeal. You have two, as I understand it, as I was reading through, again, the applicant will tell you what he thinks exactly. his appeal is about. But I see two letters, one May 3rd, right. one May 25th. And um, the essence is your job is to decide whether or not the code enforcement officer or LPI, as she was serving in either of those capacities, was right or wrong. Right. Not what's happening. I, I think um, the issues here are what does the ordinance say? And, you know, or what does the subdivision law say? And did the code officer or LPI right. get it right? Now, I, don't, I have absolutely no earthly idea what the Superior Court case is, is about. But you don't, sorry. So, so what I'm saying is if the applicant thinks that it somehow bears on the legality or whether or not the determination under the ordinances was correct, then he should have some leeway to just mention what that is. But clearly, we're not going down the, and into the merits of a lawsuit that has right. nothing to do with the scope of what you're looking at. And I guess that's what the concern was. Did it have any scope in what we're looking at? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I will say I will be skeptical that it would, and I'll tell you why. Because if we are here in this room as the, the town of Berwick to determine whether the a town official made an appropriate determination, right? If the town was somehow involved in this lawsuit, we probably know Would about that. that. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, having said that, there's a specific reference to a particular uh, item in the ordinance on, on this one, and it refers to... Uh, here. It's on page 62, um, FC. So where there's been a specific uh, item in the ordinance that's been being requested for us to, to review, it seems like we would have standing on this issue. Uh, Mr. Al-Jazari mentioned that his concern was FC on page 62, so I I believe we do have standing to hear what his concerns are. So uh, based on that, I believe that uh, this board should hear uh, Mr. al Jazari's concerns about that particular part. So right now, can we just focus on that and then we'll, once we get this one resolved or under, get an understanding, then we'll move to the second one. You may need a better understanding of where I'm coming from. Could you, uh, sorry, Mr. Alge, could you stand up? I just feel like you might have a better understanding as to where um, I'm going with that argument when you hear the rest of the argument. 
but I can try to approach it separately that way if you wish. I, I think our the only thing we're going to be able to act on is what you've re referred to. So I guess that's what I need you to explain to me what your concerns are with the letter dated May 25th, 2022. What, what do you think that the town has done incorrectly in that regard? Well, you look at the, you have that in front of you, uh, 711 FC states that septic systems serving on a structure on one lot are not allowed to be located on abutting or neighboring lots. And so that's exactly the condition that my neighbor had with me. He had his septic system crossing my boundary lines and onto my lot. So I requested from Mrs. McCabe to provide a violation letter to give them, stating that they are in violation of 711 FC uh, and to have them move their septic system. Um, at which point, Mrs. McCabe didn't even respond to that request. Uh, and I continued to push it and continued to ask for it. And it didn't seem like she really was forthright and wanted to provide that. She did mention that it was not in her wheelhouse or not part of her job to take care of that. And that's a civil matter because the deed had wording that provided that that yeah. uh, substance to be there. Um, and so I went on to say, well, um, we, you know, easement or no easement, you know, the provision does not allow that. And that is not the intent. Uh, there is no exception in this provision that says if you have an easement that you can continue to put this septic system here. And so she then, after I explained that to her a week later, I get a letter stating that not only does that not matter, but they are not in violation because the easement in her mind is all that mattered and that they should be able to keep their septic system there. So she took what I said when I said there is no exception and then she added the exception as though that is within her wheelhouse to do so and sent a letter to me stating just that. Uh, you have that in front of you, the letter? Yes, yeah. yep. 25th letter. Okay. So she goes up out of her way to say that it's illegal whether the leasement is there or not. Um, so to me, that is not in part of what she should be doing. She should have stuck to the, the code and provided me that violation letter. But as you probably read my complaint, this goes way beyond that. This has to do with her being a neighbor okay. and favoritism. So. Now, um, it's my understanding that it, the septic system now is located on the appropriate property is that true that's correct so i since she didn't provide me the letter i sent my own letter to their lawyers and to them saying that you guys are in violation of 711 fc and so they took that to heart and they went ahead and moved their septic system entirely onto their land so at this point in time there's no violation is that true at this point in time there is no violation okay but the point was being is that I have an ongoing civil matter in the Superior Court with these people, and my job was to prove to them that were, they were in the wrong. And this letter would have gone a long ways to show the judge that, listen, these people are in the wrong. Here's a, a, a violation from the town. They, but I wouldn't get it. But now what I got is a letter that favors her neighbor that says it is allowed so that they can take that to the court and say, oh, look, the town said it was okay. The, there's an exception here. I understand. Unfortunately, I don't want to use that choice of word, probably bad choice. We can only act on what is there. And right now, if that septic system has been moved, you're now, there's no violation in the ordinance. So I think our authority at that point in time is done. We, 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 I, I, I don't agree with that because that letter should have been provided to me. I should have that in my but folder. I don't have the, the only thing I have the authority to do is to look at the ordinance and make sure the ordinance is followed. And at this point in time, you've told me that the, there is no violation of the ordinance now. The, the septic system is on the, the appropriate property. So 
I can't make any finding here because I don't have the authority to make that finding. I, the board, has no, there's no violation now of the ordinance. So there's nothing that we can do for a finding. Well, there's a letter. Just, just, just one second. Am I missing something? It, it, it's, it's a little difficult because the facts are unclear here, okay? There is, as you probably well know, this concept of mootness, right? In order for there to be um, for a board, or I'm just likening it to a court, so I'll analogize to you're the court, essentially, that in order for you to weigh on something, there still has to be a live issue in controversy, and if not, then it becomes moot, and I think that's exactly what you're arguing. Now, I think an important question to ask is, we have that letter dated, I think this was the May 25th letter? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, I hear Mr. Al-Daraji, am I pronouncing your that's name correct. wrong? Right, uh, saying that at the time, perhaps, that letter was written, <clears throat> I think that's a, that, that's something you might want to ask, is that at the time, and, and maybe the code enforcement officer, right. in, in conjunction with Mr. Al-Daraji, can clarify that. At the time it was written, was that septic system already moved onto the property? If that's mm -hmm. the case, in my view, that's determinative. What happened in the past is irrelevant. Um, to me, what's critical is what was the state of affairs at the at moment the, that the, that was written. The letter, the time of the letter. Okay. Um, I can, yes. The letter that I just received was way beyond, when well, the septic system was moved quite some time ago, this letter, I just received this letter that says that that was not a violation. So what you're saying is that this letter shouldn't exist either because it was a moot point. It's been moved. So why does this letter exist that favors her family friend? Um, well, we'll let the code officer come up and address that. I'm not, I can't speak for the code officer, so why don't we let Ms. McCabe come up and, and ex address that. Mr. Chairman, you may just ask if, if that piece of his, I know you said you wanted to take them in two bite-sized chunks. Right. Um, and I know that your rules specify that you want the applicant to go on interrupted. So you might ask him if that's it with respect, or if those are his full submissions with respect to the septic issue before the code officer comes on. Well, well, I, I was my intent was to just get clarification on that, and then at that point in time, I'll excuse Ms. McCabe, and, and sure. he can come back up if, if he feels like. So, um, could you address the the question that I think is before the board now of the timing of this letter? Sure. Um, do you want me to just address that question, or do you want me to just? How well, would you like me to proceed? I, I guess I think it's on the record now that at the time of this letter that there was no violation. Is that is that true now? So that is true now. Oh, yes. I mean, at the time of the letter it was true. Is That's that right? That's true. Okay. Um, I would like, but can I say a couple of things just for sure. clarifications for the board on behalf of the town? Can well, I just I, have some time? I just, at this point in time, I'm going to bring, I know I'm kind of convoluted here, but I'm going to bring Mr. Al Jazari back up to make sure that, and then if, if you feel that there needs to be more said from the town, I'll give you that opportunity. Okay, Mr. Al Jazari. So I guess it's been confirmed, you confirmed it, but the, the code officers confirmed that at this point in time, there was no, there was no violation with a letter. Is that right? And there's no violation at the time of this letter. Right. This letter was written when, there were, when the sector system has already been moved. Right. And it was because I continued to ask for the letter in emails saying, where is the letter? How come I never received the letter? Why didn't I get the letter? And, th and when she said that it was not in her uh, job description to take care of that, I was quite surprised because based on what I've read, that is exactly what she's supposed to do is to see if there's any violations and make sure they get corrected. But regardless, they, she finally sent the letter, but it was in the opposite of what I was asking for the letter. She made it with an exception. She included the exception in the letter that she made up that has nothing to do with 7-Eleven FC. She just threw it in there to make it work. That's what I'm trying to get at. So that in itself well, is not... I, I understand, and, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I can't control her letter. I mean, she felt it was necessary to put that in there, then she can speak to that. But again, as long as the 
violation, there was no violation at the time of this letter, I think for us as a board, we're, our standing is done. And I, I miss Ration said it a lot better than I did, but basically we, we don't, there was, there's no violation for us to act on here. I know that the letter may not have said exactly what you, you wanted it to say, but the code officer is going to put down the, on the letter, she can speak to it, what she feels is necessary, not what you might necessarily want in the letter. It's going to be her letter with her name and her signature on it. She's going to put in there what she feels is necessary. So I can't speak to her on that. So unless there's something overwhelming more to this part, um, do you have any anything further to say on that? Well, I want this letter to be revoked because this letter is untrue and all it does is favor the civil suit for her friend to win a case against me. So this letter should be revoked. Okay. It, it's not lawful to say an exemption exists when there is not one to exist. Okay, well, I'm going to, are you, so let's let Ms. McCabe come up and speak to that. You have the floor. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, let's let's just go back in time a little bit to see what happened here, so you guys can understand a little bit further um, the lot splits that are in question tonight that we're not speaking about right now. Mr. Alderaji owned the property, and he performed the lot split with the septic on another parcel of land. Just to be clear. So it was originally on one piece, and when there was a lot split, it ended up on another piece. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's okay. our understanding as the town. Okay. So Mr. Algeraji came to the Code Enforcement office, office during the time where COVID was happening. Um, we were working half remote, half on site. James was there. James talked to him. I spoke to him. We never disregarded anything he said. Um, we so he brought it to our attention that there was a clause in the deed that they had to move their septic system he wanted us to write a violation letter um town of Berwick, we try to work with people before writing violation letters we've spoken about this before um mr keys and his wife are um they're not abutting neighbors of mine um they are not i don't know them um I know them because they used to walk in our neighborhood. They don't even live in our neighborhood anymore. When I approached Mr. Key about moving his septic tank, his problem wasn't not wanting to do so. His problem was he wasn't sure where to start. To get a septic design, you have to call an engineer. And sometimes you can leave messages for months for them, and they don't always call you right back. Um, and anybody who's built a new house recently or dur during COVID or even tries to do anything right now would know that it's really hard to get a call back. I'm not sure that's the case. I know that the Keys um, told us that they were trying to find an engineer to come up with a, you know, subsurface wastewater disposal plan. Finally did that. Um, as soon as they got that plan, they acted on it immediately. Um, and they move that septic onto their own property. Okay. So, and to speak to the letter and why this letter was written, it was a recommend, recommendation of our town manager to give Mr. Alderaji, who wouldn't accept that it was closed and it was finalized um, as an answer. Uh, we just wanted to give him the opportunity to appeal it if he needed to. So that's why the letter was written. It was actually written on Mr. Alderaji's behalf um, just so that he had something to come here with today so that he could have his case known Thank and heard. You. Thank you. Okay. We didn't talk about the exception that she just decided to add. Can you step up, Mr. Oh. Uh, she, she was supposed to come up and talk about the exception that she decided to add to the 7-Eleven FC. So the exception being that if you have the an easement, easement the you can have a septic system on the person's land. Where did that come from? Did you want to speak to that? Quickly? Yes. So if you look on the um, first paragraph of that letter, that actually that it had an easement access 
um, the SWWD from MAP, you know, U1, whatever, that Eastman, it says it right there. We included it because it's actually referenced in the um, Registry of Deeds. In Registry of Deeds. That we didn't write an exception there. We put it in there for the board. Right. So you could access that, it. That's, yep. what it, it, it. that's what you found during your... Um, well, because that's, that's part of the information, right? right. So that's what he's right. appealing. So it's right there so that if you guys wanted to go on the registry and de of these and pull that up, you knew exactly where to find yeah, it. Like to see right. it. Yeah, I, I will just say, from a, this is just being procedural, um, it may have been referenced, but if it's not in the record, that's that's important. You know, the, this board doesn't do its own research to find documents. It must be presented by either of the parties. Right. Mm -hmm. so, you Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Or? I think I'm all set at Thank this you. point in time. So, I guess I'm going to defer to Ms. Rachel quickly here. I believe we don't have any standing at this point in time. Uh, do you the, mean the, the, it's been resolved? The, I mean, the issue that before us that was referenced is that the question about it being on another not someone else's property it now is on the proper the appropriate property so I guess I'm not sure what we need to do sure. from this point okay so so again just to broaden the lens and trying to make it as simple as possible not that any of this is simple right but the job of the Board of Appeals is to determine whether or not the applicant or appellant same same thing has carried his or her burden of proof you mentioned burden of proof to establish that the code enforcement officer or LPI in this case erred in her decision okay so that's the question did she did she make a mistake essentially okay and here you're doing this and I didn't I don't want to throw around legal terms but we're a board of appeals here but there are two standards of review sometimes boards of appeals take an appellate review you're just kind of looking at the record before you you have broader powers here. You do what's called a de novo review, and that's just what it sounds like from scratch. You get to look at all of the evidence, hear from the parties, and make a decision. Did the code officer get it right? Okay, and so that's really the question. Was she wrong or was she right? You look at the letter, you see the basis for that decision, and you determine whether she got it right or wrong. And that is, that's entirely within your purview. I think you'd ask me the question about, okay, you know what's the relevant time period here I think I answered that question and then you make that decision um, I think the question is less well hey there's no more violation I think the question is was there a violation at the time the letter was written and that to me is the question before you okay, okay. Mr. Chair <coughs> yes I think we need to see this deed it's a very relevant uh, you know this these we need to see this piece of paperwork and see if it was in fact you know, at the time when they split it, you know, if it was in fact there, then there's not a problem there. One thing I will say, and I think that maybe the code <coughs> officer at LPI can address this issue, right? We absolutely have these provisions that are, are put forward, that, and I think relevant here is 711F, right? That, but these are, I don't have the ordinance. Do you have the full ordinance, Tammy? Mm -hmm. my, my sense is that these are performance standards or general standards that must be met when there is an application before the board that they're considering, right? Um, hold on one sec. These are in the general performance standards, general requirements, okay? So this is what the code officer planning board is going to be looking at when they're approving something, okay? Um, who knows when this was approved? I don't know when this was approved. There's nothing before this board or anything that I've heard from the code officer or the applicant about, you know, what we're talking about here. So, yes, maybe when this lot was conveyed, a building permit was issued, this should have been all of these, you know, all of these criteria. It's not just, it's, it's parking, it's signs, it's buffer areas, it's explosive materials, all of these things should have been considered. But, but just because there is a provision in an ordinance that says X, Y, or Z has to happen, if that building permit or that lot was developed 20 years ago, who knows if these were even <coughs> in effect at that time, right? So you might not have to go into that and look at the easement. You may just decide, look, A, there was a requirement. 
we don't even know if that a requirement applied at the time this, this, this deed was split. We have no idea, right? But even if it was, the problem at the time that letter was written was resolved. And I think you can make that decision based on that. I mean, if you're inclined to get additional evidence, by all means, you can certainly ask for that, I think. But I also would recommend that you have the parties. They each make their case. They have the burden, or I should say Mr. Aldraji, as the applicant, has the burden. If that evidence is not before you, then it's their burden to right. submit that evidence to support their own case. Okay. And the same applies, I mean, not that the code officer has any burden of proof, it's the applicants, but if, you know, again, she has every right to put in whatever documents she wants in support. But, you know, as, as one of your board members said, the burden is clearly on the applicant to establish their case, which requires, of course, the submission of evidence to do so. <clears throat> Did you have anything else that's relevant to this? Well, I mean, we, we just got done saying that, you know, it's not really the duty to uh, decipher the laws and have you do search of the, and decipher the law. That's not really what you're here to do. And that's exactly what she's doing when she adds that ex easement uh, exception into 711 because that was never there. That's something she just decided to add. That's not up to her to do that. That's my evidence that she added something that's not in there on her own accord to help someone out. That's the evidence I have for you. The, um, the fact of the matter is, the, if you continue to read the deed where that says they have an easement, if you continue, which is the part that she happened to leave out, it states that the grantor has mutual say in where the new septic system will be replaced. But that wasn't in there. So see how convenient that you're getting half the e easement information? So that, that's kind of why that's not in your department because you only hear half the truth. The other half is in the, still in the deed. You can read that as well. And there's an addendum to the deed that was also written. That was not discussed in her letter. So only the part that helps her neighbor is the part that was put in here. All the other relevant information that says that uh, that easement was not, is, was extinguished and was no longer there. She left that out. We don't have the deed. Right, but you to, have the fact that she wrote an exception that doesn't belong in a code. That's enough to say, why, why is that exception put in there? Why did you just happen to put this one exception in? Why didn't she put the exception that, that benefited me? Why didn't she write, oh, well, you, the, the grantor has mutual say. It says you're in easement. The, the grantor has mutual say in where the sector system replacement goes. Why was that not in there then? <clears throat> Did you want to speak to that? Mr. Chair, we simply put the what deed book and page it was because you guys get these documents ahead of time. You guys were welcome to look up that deed ahead of time. We didn't write any information that was in that deed, just simply where to find it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, in an effort to just kind of um, address some of the issues and concerns Mr. Eldaraji had raised, um, you know, as I said, I think the, the important piece here is to determine whether or not it was an error at the time the letter was met. You look to the ordinance provisions, even assuming they apply here. So let's assume they do. The ordinance says, and I'm citing from 7.11FA, uh, which requires each proposed lot must be served by a septic system located within its boundaries. So the question is, at the time that letter was written, assuming this ordinance even applies, was there a lot serving, or, or was the septic system that served the lot on that lot within its own boundaries? So, yes. Their old, their old septic system is still on my land. They have not removed it. They refuse to move it. They think that was their land, but it's not. They're trying to steal the land. They won't be able to, but they won't remove that septic system. It's on my land still. So this is still relevant. I, I, Even though they put the new one on their land, a new one was put on their house to serve their house. They left the old one sitting in my front yard. I expect you're going to have to go to court 
to get that resolved. I mean, I, we well, don't well, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, but that is still showing you that it's abutting, it's still existing. So we thought it was no longer existing, but I just want to back up and say, yes, this issue is still existing because they never removed the septic system off my front yard. So it is still existing. That septic system is still there. <coughs> I think if the board is okay with what we've listened to, we'll move on to the second, or should we act on this one first? I mean, I, we can do it either way. Yeah, I think, I think um, either way is fine procedurally, but frankly, why not do it while it's fresh in your mind? That's what I was and, thinking. And, and the board... You know, your fellow board members may have some questions of their own, and right. if and not, then, we, then you move on to sort of deliberate on this particular piece, and then you can make whatever motions you think appropriate with respect to this portion okay. of the appeal. I think that sounds. I, I, I hesitate to close the hearing because typically we. Yeah, you don't. Th I don't think you need to do that. I would you just. You know, like I say, we've done that, and then yeah. basically close. They're the not two home. separate appeals. They're just two right. prongs. So. so uh, under the advice of our lawyer, I think this is the time we should discuss any questions that you will move into the discussion phase of this. We close the public comment on this particular piece of uh, this item one. Are there any questions, concerns? What you're choosing here, I guess, is opening up the discussion piece. Um, do you have any questions or any concerns? We can talk amongst ourselves. This is, <coughs> this is the time that, that we're able to deliberate, to kind of come to some understanding of what we're, what we're prepared to do. Are you comfortable with what, I guess, where we're at is at the time of the letter, I think we've heard um, that the septic system, which is what was referenced here in the ordinance, was in fact on the property, the, the, the person's property where it was supposed to be. Nope. Um, I, I don't know what else that we have the authority to, to do on this one. Um, I know there's some concern about this, the old septic system, but I don't think that's in our preview to, to resolve, but what do you think? <coughs> I see septic system serving a structure on another law, or not allowed. I realize it's still there, but it's no longer serving them. If you were to look in the words on a trait C here. <coughs> So serving would be in use. Right. Like it's, it's now dis in right? and the wording there, it's, it's disconnected now. It's no longer serving. Right. It's existing, but it's not serving. It's also a, a body can cross in my mind. We're we're <coughs> closed the public comment oh. at this point in time. So <coughs> how are you doing? You uh, comfortable with what's what has been discussed here? Yeah. What do you think, Pat, Ernie? You, you um, I, I, I feel like that this, the letter on this date, um, the septic had already been moved. Um, so I feel that that, that that issue is no longer um, relevant. And the part that, um, that Mr. Algerati, um is still dealing with civilly in civil court. We don't have anything to do with. So we only have the letter to work with. And if everyone is in agreement, um, which seems to be um, the code enforcement officer and Mr. Al Jaraji both agree that at this point in time on May 25th, 2022, the septic system had been moved, then. That's the fact. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's all about the timing of the letter. And uh, 
I have not heard any evidence um, that would substantiate that there was a violation um, or that there was a mistake at the time of the letter. So I would be in agreement that our uh, we don't have that, that authority to invent things. And I feel that the letter is um, <laughs> I feel that the letter then um, was done. I, the letter is correct. I don't know if correct is the right term, but um, it, the letter is not a mistake. We're trying to determine if that piece of her decision is a mistake or not. I would say this letter is not a mistake. So do we want to make a motion to I guess I'm gonna absolutely I'm happy to help formulate and um, I can sort of lob something out there and instead of repeating it you can say so moved and somebody can second it and right. you can be off to the races if you agree so I think what you could say is you know whoever makes the motion could say I move to deny the appeal relating to the May 25th 2012 excuse me I am really dating myself <laughs> 2022 um, letter from the CEO LPI indicating that there was no violation I think that's what you say does that make sense that you're basically you're 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 denying the appeal on the basis that the May 25th 2022 letter um, was in error and basically you're you're in doing so what the practical effect is, is is to say that code enforcement officer did not err and therefore you're denying the appeal on that basis so moved so moved there any, there, there's a motion on the table is there a second that second. seconds the motion any further discussion all those in favor do do we want to roll call or can we just if you're all present if there I see somebody's out there but I'm not sure if they're a board member if not a board, a board member. member then in it, if everybody's physically present the the FOA the FOA law on remote participation does not require a roll call if I could say something um, I want to uh, validate the fact that the appellant, <coughs> excuse me, the appellant has the right to appeal. And it's an important part of town government. Uh, unfortunately, given the evidence that we have, we cannot support that uh, appeal. But uh, I want people to know that, that uh, that the right of appeal is always there and that uh, it's a it's me for me a lesson that uh, when we start thinking in terms of going before boards of appeals or in court cases that are adjudicated in the in the courts of our country that you have c clear evidence uh, and that it's substantiated by uh, more than just one piece of evidence so uh, that's I just want to make that statement for the record okay mm -hmm. all those in favor of the motion that's on the table raise your hand please. all five have agreed with the motion we have a second item on the agenda our second part of this uh, appeal and that is involved in a subdivision question the letter on this part of the hearing is dated May 3rd of 2022 where uh, the code officer has said that the there needs to be subdivision review of an app of uh, some 
of, of an, the permits that were brought to her. Um, so this one, I really kind of it was it's a, a difficult part for me trying to understand whether we should even hear this and I'm very thankful that the lawyer is here tonight to speak to this uh, before I ask her to speak. M my concern is is I couldn't really find anything in the subdivision in the ordinance that specifically talked about subdivision. There's a, a piece in the ordinance that talks about um, the definition of subdivision and then it, you move on to go see subdivision regulations, but I didn't think we had any standing as far as what subdivision regulations were. So, but I will let uh, Miss Rasheen talk to her because she convinced me. Well, she's going to try to convince. She convinced me. She needs to convince the board that we have standing to actually hear anything to do with subdivision. So I'm going to sure. let you speak. Absolutely. I'm happy to. And and, and, and I, to be very clear, this is absolutely your decision. And I'm really not trying to convince you of, uh, in any way, positive or negative. But I just wanted to give you kind of my thoughts on it and why I would recommend hearing it. Okay. So again, back to that notion that you only have that authority that you're specifically given. Absolutely right. You look at, I mean, what is at issue here is the subdivision um, statute and arguably the subdivision, even though it's not referenced in um, Ms. McCabe's letter, the subdivision regulations the town has deal with the very same issues about what's a subdivision, what's required, the review process, um, and it's taken pretty much verbatim from the subdivision statute, which she quotes here. In your powers and duties under the land use ordinance, because the subdivision regs Se totally separate ordinance. Oftentimes in some towns, the subdivision regs are part of the land use ordinance. Here, separate and distinct in a totally different box. You look at those, there's absolutely no discussion about appeal, except to go to superior court because it's an appeal, arguably, of a planning board decision, which makes perfect sense. This board should not have to reinvent the wheel for, you know, you know those planning boards. Sometimes they go for, you know, a year reviewing something. So of course you don't want to have that. That goes right to court. So what do you have the authority over? You have the authority over three things. Interpretations of the, of the ordinance, which is the land use ordinance. This is not the land use ordinance that we're talking about. You have authority over variances. This is clearly not a variance. You have the, and I'm going to read it out, forgive me for being kind of pedantic here, but administrative review, right? You have the authority to hear and decide appeals where it is alleged that there is a land use violation, let's put a pin in that, or an error in any order requirement decision or determination by the code officer in the enforcement of this ordinance, okay? Well, we know it's not that. It's not the enforcement of this ordinance. It's the enforcement of subdivision statute or arguably the subdivision regs. But it says the first part of that sentence, which is before the or, says to hear and decide appeals where it is alleged that there is a land use violation. Now, subdivision law, in my view, is very much a regulation of land use, right? And so if there is a violation of subdivision law, one would argue or one could say that it is a land use violation. And so while it's not pretty and it's not wrapped up in a neat little bow, and reasonable minds could differ, I would say that we are here. What you may not want to have, as much as we enjoy each other's company, you might not want to um, have a remand if the court decides that you do, in fact, have jurisdiction because it was a alleged violation of a, excuse me, an alleged land use violation. We could be back here again having this same um, deja vu all over again. So I think there is enough here that authorizes this board to exert its authority. I could be wrong. If somebody appeals this decision, the court could say, hey, nope, there's no jurisdiction here. But what could happen is if you decide that you don't and somebody wants to appeal that decision, you go up to the court. If we're wrong and they say, hmm, land use violation, subdivision reg, that, that's a land use violation, we're back here. They remand it back. So um, my view is there's enough here that says you have jurisdiction. And in order to hear this, that may mean that you don't have to hear it again if, if we're wrong. 
that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, again, the question, do we have standing? Um, is the board comfortable with the explanation of why we should hear this part of the appeal? Um, I'm kind of looking for us. There's no sense in moving on if, if the majority of this board thinks that we shouldn't be listening to this and, and we want to remand it basically to Superior Court because that would, I believe, be his next step if, if we don't hear this. Mm -hmm. um, are we okay? Yes. Yep. Okay? Good. Fantastic. So, having said that, Mr. Al Jazari, um, the board is going to hear hear your concerns about the subdivision letter. Um, let me just make sure I don't have anything I wanted to say before that, before I have you uh, come up. It looks like, uh, so we'll reference the letter. Um, everyone has a copy of the subdivision, so that before we get started here, we know um, Ordinance. Yes, do you have a copy of the subdivision ordinance? Land use. You just have the land use? And right. Because as he said, <laughs> not something that we typically see. It could be, and it couldn't be. It doesn't have to be. If, if need be, I'm more than happy to read out the relevant definitions if that would be helpful. And I have a, also a, I believe, a, a second copy here. But let's, um, I'll let. Miss uh, Ray can speak to what it is, what we're going to be talking about here, and I have a copy that I can pass around to as well. Would you go ahead and? Yeah, sure. I mean, so if we look at the letter, and again, I hesitate to go too found, far down the road because you'll have the parties who are right. making their sure. submissions. But bottom line is, this is the question of whether or not the the property um, is or should have been subject to subdivision review by the planning board. And under the state statute, um, it does require that any, well, let me, let me just tell you what a subdivision is under the state law and your own subdivision regs. If it is, then state law is clear that you must actually go to the planning board to get approval for that subdivision. That, yeah. So yeah. subdivision is defined as a division of, a, and it's complicated. A division of a tract or parcel of land. Sorry. Oh, good. You have another copy. A division of a tract or parcel of land, which itself is a defined term that we, we should look at the definition of that. But a division of a tract or parcel of land into three or more lots with any, within excuse me any five-year period that begins on or after 1971. So this is the tricky part. This definition applies whether the division is accomplished, accomplished by sale lease, development, or otherwise, okay? So that otherwise is really not super helpful, but it, in, it, in my view, demonstrates an intent to basically <coughs> say, if you're gonna divide your lot, whether you sell it, convey it, or I don't know what otherwise means, but it's pretty broad that the intention here is that that will constitute a subdivision, okay? Um, the term subdivision also includes and this is structure or structures, so I'm not going to talk about that because here we're really talking about a, a develop, excuse me, a division of a lot, not a building. Okay, and then it gives some guidance what it means, like what does divide mean? What what is this division? And it says in determining whether a tract or parcel of land, again, there's that term again. A tract or parcel is basically, uh, well, let me just read it to you. I won't paraphrase. Uh, a tract or parcel means all contiguous land in the same ownership except land that is located on opposite sides of a public or private road. So if it's in contiguous ownership, it's a tractor parcel. That's the basic gist, okay? So let's go back to in determining whether a tractor parcel is divided into three or more lots. The first dividing of the parcel is considered to create the first, the, the first two lots. And the next dividing of either of those first two lots is considered the third, third lot, okay? 
So then there are a bunch of exceptions to that. And I won't go through those. <laughs> but so I think your analysis here into determining whether, again, your job is to determine whether or not the code enforcement officer erred in her determination in this letter. That's your job. You look at the definition of subdivision. You determine whether the property at issue was or was not a subdivision. And if you determine it was, then the law says any subdivision must get planning board review and approval before lots can be conveyed. And if you find A, that this falls within a subdivision, and B, therefore, that it re required planning board approval and did not obtain it, then I think the natural conclusion is to uphold the code enforcement officer's letter, meaning she did not err, and therefore you would deny the appeal. If, on the other hand, you believe she has erred in her determination, then you grant the appeal. And that's, that's your analysis. And I know it's somewhat complicated, and I'm here to answer questions as you go along, um, but I think the next step, of course, is to let the applicant make his case, and then you hear from the code officer. I have one clarification, Mr. Chairman. What's that? Can I have one clarification? Uh, you mentioned across the road. Does that mean to, that means contiguous? The, the tractor you parcel? Two, you have one lot and you had two lots on one side of the road, but one of the, the third lot is on the other side of the road. Does that still mean contiguous? It, it does, except lands located on opposite sides of a public private road are considered each to be a separate tractor parcel unless, and this is critical, the road was established by the owner of the land on both sides. Okay, so that, that's a critical piece of information. Because it was that originally contiguous and therefore they put a road in. Exactly, there. exactly. So, so that in and of itself would not mean they're separate tracks. Right. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so everyone's got a somewhat of an idea. I think that it's could probably get a little confusing on, on where, where we're headed with this. Um, so given that, um, Ms. Dalcesari, would you like to come up and present your case? Well, I'm looking at the letter I received from the town, and the first sentence is that Rosario and Allison Pellegrino divide their land and create three lots. Now, I'm not sure why that's on this one. I, I bought, my, my mother and I myself bought these um, lots in good faith. I mean, we were told that these were lots that, that we could purchase and we purchased them. So I'm not sure how I'm responsible for something that they may have done. Um, but I will say that it was divided up by civil consultants. And um, from what I can understand, it's been legal. Uh, you received the deeds uh, from that back in 2013. and. We haven't heard nothing in regards to anything being done incorrectly at this time. This is the first time we've heard anything that's been done incorrectly since 2013. Um, Did you want to, me to speak on that, or do you just want to continue? No, I'm going to just continue if it's okay. all right. So as I said, we, we had uh, purchased the three lots uh, from the Pellegrinos, and my mother uh, purchased one of the lots. I purchased another lot, and then her and I purchased one together. That was the three lots that we purchased. And at no time did her or myself ever divide any of those lots more than two times. But as she said, it takes three times to make it a subdivision. Uh, we never went beyond two. And as a matter of fact, if it's okay, can I approach and provide you a flow chart that would make this a lot easier to explain and follow along? Do you have a flow chart? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of deed numbers, a lot of book and page numbers. Thank you, sir. So, oh, sorry, it's two there. So. If you guys have the butters, want to see what he's looking at, they're right here. So, oh. And uh, that flow chart goes with this right here. Thank you. Oh, good, it's big enough to see. 
<laughs> and Mr. Chairman, may I just ask for the record that that document that's being presented is identified? I'm just not sure what it is. It's the same document that's in the letter. So the plan? It's, it, yes. The plan. Okay. Well, the, the same one that was in his application is just a lot bigger. And did you get a copy of the full chart? Uh, I have it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, do you have another copy of that bigger plan? Um, if you don't, it's no, I'm sorry. Okay. It's so, the flow charts, you know, as you can see, they start at the top. That's where Rosario Pellegrino, God rest his soul, sold us those lots in 2007. Uh, one, uh, to my, one number one was Joyce Aldaranji, number two was Joyce and Adnan Aldaranji, and number three is Adnan Aldaranji. Um, so that was on January 8th, 2007. And those are all book and page numbers and all registered in your county registry of deeds. One, two, three there. And what I did there is I put three different boxes so you can just follow along and how, and it shows quite clearly that we never divided any lot more than two times. And we only done it once. Well, I've owned this lot for 15 years and we've only split it once. So as you follow the arrows down, the, uh, under number one, um, we sold one lot to a Tom Michelson, and that's his book and page number. And the other lot went to my father-in-law, the back lot to that lot. That back lot went to my father-in-law, and he held on to that. And the number two, uh, Joyce and Anand Aldaraji, we decided to keep that. I put a garage on that. That's probably going to be where I put my home. So that was just showing that it's just the two lots under the same name nothing fancy there number three is under my name and you can see i sold the one lot the first the front of the lot to roman pascarella and i kept the back lot for myself uh to just to have um and now you can see those deeds are all been registered and they're all in your county registered deeds so um there is no issue with that that can be looked up that's all verifiable um, so at that time, uh, as Jen had said, I had gone in to discuss getting a building permit and to start working the land. The economy was coming in the back and I wanted to get a building permit to start building and went to go talk to them and we discussed it and we talked about property lines and frontages and where the driveways would go and, and, and all the, to, to that effect. Um, and it came to our knowledge that the, uh, the tax maps were never adjusted um, when those deeds and lots were developed in 2013. Uh, I'm sorry, they were sold on uh, 2012, Tom Michelson and 2012 to Roman Pascarella. So those deeds, we found out, were never um, taken by the town and none of the uh, tax adjustments were made to those lots. So in a sense, Tom Michelson, or the current owner, has been paying for Bruce's lot and um, Roman Pascarella or the current owner has been paying since 2012 my back lot taxes so I agreed at the time I said to James he said well you know you're gonna have some back taxes owed." and I said that's no problem I'd be happy to whatever that adjustment is to refund Tom Michelson or Roman Pascarella or the current owner if they, if they deserve a refund no problem and his comment was to do make that happen I had to register the deeds so that the taxes could be done and the permitting process could begin I so then at uh, 2021 I went ahead and registered the deeds upon his request uh, just to find out not too long after that that same that same action of registering those deeds is now he's saying is my, my violation and that I will have to start all over again because now those lots are all one lot now is what I'm being told <clears throat> So that is pretty interesting just all by itself. Um, if you think about it and you look back at this, you would say that had the town just um, adjusted the tax map back in 2012 that uh, for Roman Pascarella and Anand Aldaraji and then for Tom Michelson and Bruce Brady in 2012, if that was done, then there would be no issue here. There would be no back taxes owed 
there would be no no need to think I would need to register and record all the other four deeds that I had. Now, mind you, I had those deeds for eight years, and I said to, to James, I said, I don't think we need to really record this because until I convey or sell one of these lots. Um, and then, he, but he insisted that that's the way that we get the permits. And who am I to argue with, uh, you know, the planning board manager at the time? So of course I registered the deeds. But what's absurd here is, is that by registering these deeds upon request, I am being told I'm in violation. And that these lots are all contiguous now, and I'm back to one lot. And I have to start all over again. So that's what I'm being told by code and for by James. Now, so I, of course I asked to talk with them and have sit downs. I mean, there's all kinds of emails where I requested more information and I've received nothing uh, relevant to why they feel all of a sudden I have to start all over again. Um, but you can see in the, and clearly in the flow chart that none of the lots were ever divided more than twice. And I gave you the drawing so you could see that all these deeds are accounted for right in the drawing. Uh, all, they're all, so if you look at number one, Joyce Eldaraji, she is the lot A. So that's lot A right there. And Bruce, um, and, and I'm sorry, and I'm sorry, it turned out to be Bruce Brady who ended up owning that. And that's lot A. And his name is right on there and it shows the deed, it shows the book and page number as him owning that back lot and it's a completely different deed and page number than the other two. And then and you'll notice on number two, that was for Joyce and Adnan, that was lot B and C. And I said, again, my garage is on B and C is right next to it. Um, we haven't really decided what we're gonna do with that. So no one, we didn't convey that to anybody or sell that to anybody. But you, the page and book number are right there. You can see those. And then on number three, um, number three is lot D and you can see lot D where the name is there and the book and page number all different from what is seen on the other ones and and Norman Pasquarella right in front of it so there's no surprises here everything has been registered properly recorded properly um, so I'm confused to say the least well I was confused until I learned what really was going on um, and then you know that story uh, there's a family friend but that she's trying to we'll, we'll keep help. I so. don't, we're just going to stick with the facts here. Yep. Um, that is a fact. <clears throat> so, in your flay chart, you're saying that all six of those deeds, all when you broke each of those three lots up, all those all had deeds that were recorded? Yeah, everything's been recorded. Everything you see listed on that flow when, chart is verifiable. When were they recorded? It says right there, 2012. Okay, so when it... So you must have received a copy, or Berwick, I know, receives a copy of every deed from the York County Register deed once they've been recorded. And so someone must have dropped the ball and not done the tax adjustments that they needed to do and notify the people but, of the new lot lines. But you're only showing two that were recorded in 2012. Is that true? Yeah, well, uh, 2012 is for Roman, yes, and, and Tom, because the other lots deeds are still, as you can see, they never changed. They went from the top box of Unknown, say, look at number three. So that's Unknown Eldaraji. At that book and page number, I uh, carried on down to the next box. Oh, it's still the same that. deed, never changed. And that goes for all of the other boxes as well. One deed carried down, and one deed was developed for the new lot that was sold. The I'm going to you, revise the deed when when the lots split the same the, the same deed moved us down. Well, right. it, it have to be revised then because the deed has to be changed with the, the parameters and, right. and everything. Um, so right. So what, I'm sorry. What was the question? So if, if you split a lot, you're going to have to change the the deed for six. You will take item one here. Mm -hmm. So you got Joyce, and it gets split to Tom and Bruce. Mm -hmm. You got one deed that's registered, new deed, and then the map, the size of 60, 61 one has to be 
smaller now, right? If you've cut a piece out of it. That's correct. So that deed, shouldn't that have been registered? It, it has been registered and it's it's under book 16412 and page 184. And that date, I'm sorry, I must have omitted that date and when that happened. I apologize, but that obviously you can refer to the York Registry County Deeds and see that that is there. I just forgot to put the date on that. So do you have the date? I mean, did no. they get recorded at the same time? I, I, I don't have the date on me. It would have had to be in the action affected both pieces at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah, I imagine it's the same time. <clears throat> well, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's in the same. So that one split. How did you come up with these these numbers? Are you just, I mean, what I'm having a difficult time following is I can go back, the tax map should show and reflect when you change, when a deed is sold, when a piece of property is sold or there's a deed registered, the, should, the tax map should change so that we can right. see that those are two, two lots split off. I agree, and that's why I was told that the HD that's registered at the York County Registry does get sent to the town for that reason. So, all of these, every one of those happened in, in 2012, is what you're saying. That's all those splits. That's, that's what I'm thinking. I apologize. I missed that one date, but yes, that's what well, would make sense. Well, it's one, two, three, four. There's four, four of them that Four dates date. that aren't there. <clears throat> and that's the four that, that carry down to the next. And that's the four that carry down. Right, so. But they never needed to be carried down. They could have been left just the way they were. They never needed to be carried down because the tax adjustment could have taken place right within that one box frame right there we never needed these other deeds to be registered to to take care of that tax situation well, i could have held on to them wait a minute here you, so you registered them twice no i mean you're oh. showing that you registered those four deeds in 2021 not not in 2012 right so this is what james said hey sorry it was not known yet it was kind of not, not known by the town. He did it, York County Registry of Deeds. And then um, when he came to inquire about doing some building, and said, oh, these aren't on our books. So he said, register them. So he went up and registered them again. And that's Can you register them twice? So <clears throat> um, I think you can register things twice. It happens all the time. But I'm not sure if that's what was no. happening. What actually. happened, why they had to be registered um, a second time. Um, it's not, it didn't have to be, first of all. We didn't have to register them a second time. But why they're a different deed, sir, is because there's so many right-of-ways and so many different things that had to be signed over. So a small triangle may have been on one person that had to be moved to another. So that that whole, the reason why those are all different deed numbers is because all the square footage and all the perimeters of the lots all changed. The frontage, the side lines, everything changed at that point so of course they would need a new deed for that and that's why they're under new numbers but again none of that had to happen i've had these deeds for eight years i've had these since 2012. do so you have a copy of those deeds for us to see so well that we they're can... in the york county registry of deeds they're all well that doesn't now. help us tonight i mean we need to see the Mr. deeds Chairman? and some dates I, I, I could have printed you 100 deeds today but i was going to save a tree these are all online i i didn't think you'd need to see every one of these deeds well we're talking about when parcels got broken up and are we following the five-year time frame for breaking them up so well, clearly we need to see when these deeds when this happened and at what time these you know what date these deeds what at, at the time that these deeds came into effect yeah, well, I wrote them all down. I missed, like I said, I apologize for the one well, there that was missed. Well, you've um, missed four, and it's the same four that come all the way down, and I think that's the, the we're at the, that's where we're at the question right now is we've got four parcels here yeah. that 
Well, if, if you want, I can take your laptop and go on uh, yorkregistry.com right now and find those dates for you in about 10 minutes if you want. And we'll take a recess. I can come back with the dates if that makes you happy. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can I ask you a quick, quick question? Yes, Aaron. Could you, in just very simply, what is it that you're appealing? They, they won't because give you me any... have the right to appeal, but I need to know what exactly, in good, clear language, what you're appealing. I'm appealing the fact that that um, Jim Bellismo and Mr. McNabb here want me to go back and start all over again through the planning board to get my a building permit. So I'm trying to get a building permit, and I'm appealing the fact that they're denying me a building permit for a lot that I divided legally. Which lot are you trying to get a building permit for? I was trying to start with lot A. Doesn't Bruce Brady own that now? Uh, he did, but I've since purchased it from him, and now it's deeded under my wife and my name. And, okay. you're, and you're saying that uh, that the letter that's being referenced in this appeal, uh, which is dated May 3rd, uh, is the letter that you're, you're saying is uh, well, let me, uh, I'll let you what, what, what do you what problem do you have with this letter? Well, it starts off again, it's there's saying that the Pellegrinos did something incorrectly, which I don't feel that should be my responsibility. If that is in case true, I'm not even saying that is true, but that's what they're saying. And then the other part of the letter that I disagree with is right at the bottom paragraph, it says, for purposes of subdivision analysis, lots A through D are considered the same tract of parcel of land. And that's only because I recorded the deeds upon the request of James Bellissimo. So now, because I did that, they're holding that against me and saying, that's one lot now, you got to start over. Okay, so that's where the error, you're, you're appealing, you're saying that that's an error. That was an error that can simply be corrected. I mean, if, if, if we thought it needed to be there for a tax adjustment, then then fine. But if it's not needed, that's, that's okay. But don't hold it against me. Don't hold it against me because I did it. Because I only did it upon your request to help with the tax adjustment and to help with getting permits. Um, sorry. Yes, Pat. I'm trying to understand sure. this diagram. Yes. So if we take number one. Yes. Um, and we start with Joyce. Joyce has taken her parcel and um, divided it once to Tom and then divided it again to Bruce? No, at the time of that, she got rid of both of them. She got rid of one to, to, to her top one. and got rid of she one. She only had number one. Mm -hmm. And now she got two. And so she, she divided it one time to Tom and divided it another time to Bruce? It's divided once and sold to two people. That's correct. All right, so she... It turned that, into two. That was not a subdivision right there, then? No. Oh. <coughs> the second parcel mm -hmm. is it true that the second parcel was divided into two pieces? Two, yeah, to lot B and C, um, but not but we didn't convey it to anyone new. It was stayed within our our family. And then the third one, again, is only into two, and one I kept with me, and one I sold to Roman Pascarella. Okay. What about, um, do you have more things to say? Do I have what? Do, do you have more to say? Um, well, let's see. Um, well, if there's no other questions, I believe, I mean, this seems to be a, a simple misunderstanding, if nothing more. Okay. And I would be happy to um, adjust the deeds uh, and convey them to which a way that satisfies the town. If they, if they need me to change a name on something, I'll change a name. I mean, this is, this is all within family, so it's easily done. This is not like this is written in stone. So I just wanted to let you know that. 
And again, just to reify, each owner has made only one division since that time in 15 years of ownership. It's not like we were just dividing, going crazy, dividing lands everywhere. So I guess that is it for me then. So this this set, this last set that James told him to do, it was simply administrative. It, nothing got split at that time. It doesn't appear so. It was just administrative. I feel like we have to look further into. You know, you can only do. You can. You're you're limited to split land every five years. You know, to have three every five years. You know. If there was no split, uh, it was an administrative change. Nothing changed with land. Land wasn't split at this time. Well, let's maybe you know, let the code officer speak, mm -hmm. and maybe she can clarify okay. something. And then at that point in time, we can okay. start to. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the board, I'm going to first read the memo that I have written for you today, and then I'm going to clarify some information for you, and then I'll be done. On January 5th, 2007, the Pellegrinos divided their land and created three lots in a five-year period from the same tract or parcel of land. One, Pellegrinos to Joyce Algeragi. Two, Pellegrinos to Adnan and Joyce Algeragi. Pellegrino, number three, Pellegrinos to Adnan Algeragi. Three right there. Yeah. The above explained lot split required subdivision review then okay by the town of Berwick Planning Board which was never applied for. Mr. Alderaji has outlined for us today that in the following years the three lots were then divided or conveyed on several other occasions resulting in four contiguous lots owned by Adnan and Tina Alderaji better described to you as lots A, B, C and D in front of you, and two other lots owned by other individuals at this time. None of the described lots have ever had planning board approval or it was never applied for planning board review at all. My recommendation for Adnan Aldaraji, Joyce Aldaraji, and Tina Aldaraji is just to simply apply for subdivision review for these lot splits from the town of Berwick Planning Board as lots A through D are considered the same tract or parcel of land under 30 MRS 4404 section 6. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them after I explain two more things. On January 12th, there was a memo written from the town manager. Do you guys have that in front of you or do you need it? We don't, don't have what year? This memo states, the subject parcels por portions of U161-2 are located on Merriam Street Extension, and well, Merriam Street, and in, in, yeah, illustrated on the enclosed unrecorded sketch plan provided by civil consultants titled Land of Adnan Alderaji, Joyce Alderaji, and Douglas Bruce Brady. Shall I continue, or do you need to? Okay. Adnan and Joyce Alderaji conveyed four lots to Adnan and Tina Alderaji, illustrated on the plan without planning board subdivision approval. The conveyances were recorded at the York County Registry of Deeds and are referenced below. The conveyed lots include an easement over a right of way, illustrated on the plan in front of you. Based on the information, it is believed that the property constitutes a subdivision per 30A MRS 4401 section 4 and would need to be reviewed and approved by the planning board. It is believed that the grantor had not reviewed the subdivision regulations 
with the town prior to transferring the property. As such, the assessing department believes the new lots Actually, I'm sorry, I w take that off the record. This is not from James Blissmo. This is from our town assessing department, Karen Fortier. I, I apologize for that. I misread it. Anyways, it's as such, the assessing department believes the new lots have been created illegally and therefore cannot be accessed to their highest and best use, which uh, without town approval. So it goes down to just show you exactly what's been conveyed and when, and when it was conveyed. Remaining acreage of lots are listed on the bottom. Now, let me tell you what's been going on. So, Mr. Alderaggio came into the code and planning office again at this around the same time as we spoke about before, or he stated he did. He, he is correct on that. He came in and he wanted to convey um, these parcels. He wanted to talk to us about it. The problem with it is we tried and tried and tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. We tried to kind of like look in the history of the lots. That's what James and I did. James was the town planner, not the town manager at the time. I want to make that clear. We did a bunch of research in the town of Berwick office to try to figure out who owned what. It was not, it's, it was always confusing. Who owned what, when the lots got split, what happened, was there ever planning board approval, whatnot. Mr. Alderaji told us, please contact civil consultants. They'll be able to tell you what's going on. I personally did that. I called civil consultants. I asked for Mr. Harmon on the phone. They asked me what I was calling in reference to, and I told them, and he had refused to get on the phone with me. And I was like, okay. So he wouldn't take my call. About probably 20 minutes later, I got a call in the code enforcement office here in Berwick and it was Mr. Harmon himself calling me. He said, Jen, I'm really sorry, what do you need? So I just explained it to him. I got halfway through my first sentence, said Mr. Alderaji's name, and he said he's no longer a client of us. We cannot speak on behalf of this application or this plan and hung up the phone. So I don't know why, I didn't ask why, I don't have the details of that. James and I were then left to figure this out for ourselves, to figure out what he actually owned, what he was trying to convey, and what he needed to do. James did not advise him to, and I was sitting right there, James did not advise him to go to the Registry of Deeds and register for lots at a time. He didn't do that. James advised him to register one at a time as he was building his, you know, subdivision that you have in front of you here, okay? Because it was the legal way to do it. So that part of this is wrong. Um, that's really all I have for this. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm not sure exactly what more pieces you want me to share. Do you know, I guess the part that still confuses me is how we went, how we recorded these pieces of property twice, or are they diff, in his flowchart, you have the flowchart there. I do. It, it shows a book indeed for uh, the middle section of this flowchart, but there's no dates on those. I think it. I think if we had dates on Mr. those, Mr. Chair, can you hold on just one second? Oh, sorry. Can you just tell me what's different on the two, just so I know? Yeah. So I didn't have the date here, so I added the dates here. It's different. It's the wrong date, so I changed the dates. Then I added a date here. Date. So I just added dates, pretty much, so it'd be more clear to understand uh, the names and book pages and all that are the same. Okay. So I don't know which document is correct. So we both have two very different documents here. So the document I have has, do you have, you gave them your version? Okay, so the, the version that we got in the code enforcement office, the planning office, and the assessor's office has Bruce Brady, Joyce Alderaji, and Adnan as their divided parcels of land for 9-11-2013. In the middle, we don't have any dates given. Can we have a copy of those? There's a whole bunch of them. Right here. 
Yeah, that would be great. Mr. Chairman, can I ask? I think I, I'm not sure which one I'm working off. Can I have the version that was just presented to the board? So this is the old one. Mr. Elder, do you by chance have a copy of the flowchart one. you presented? Is this the old one? Is this the old one? one? Yes. Dates, um, but not the one eight. that was presented. I don't think you have this one then. Our versions of this are very different. We never received the updated version. So what is this you just gave us? That's me. No. That's the flow shot that that's the flow chart that Mr. Aldraji presented to us in the code office. This is the document that he submitted to us. Oh. This is the document that he submitted to you. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please see the top dates are very different. Yeah. <clears throat> For the, the three our document has 2013, his has 2007. I changed the dates to be reflected more accurately. So, six years later. <clears throat> now, this is still within the time frame as long as. So, looking at your chart. Mine your, or Mr. Alderaj? Yours, the Mine. one that you presented. Okay, yep. It, it looks essentially, the, we're at, when we come off lot A, and we're at created lot A, was that recorded? It, it shows re, it was recorded. What date was that lot A recorded? So we have no information on that in the town assessor's office. We never see those recorded deeds. Okay. I thought we were supposed to receive recorded deeds. If they're recorded, we do receive them. If they're not recorded? We do not. So we think that th th those don't exist? Well, I'm just right. telling you how the assessing department works. They get it directly from the registry of deeds, yeah. and they record every single deed in our system and update it. And so that's when how the tax maps get updated when they get a, a deed that comes in. They, that is correct. That's how we adjust that's how our we, tax map. Yeah, we send all that information to our mapper, and he updates it for us. That's how it works. Okay. So, so I, I guess, Jen, I think we're all set for a second here. Thank you. Um, um, I, I would like to... Uh, yeah, no. Oh. <laughs> Come on back up. Uh, to me, what what are you looking at? Which one? Um, I'm looking at the one you just gave us. So the 2013 one. I, I don't know. Okay. This one, the one, the ones that are labeled <laughs> yeah. lot A, B, C, D. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, it looks like two of those lots were merged to form. Um, to form um, some of these things. Yeah, Bruce Brady and Joyce merged their pieces in order to create the lots A, B, and C. Okay. Is that the way I see it? It says portion merge. This is not my flow chart, I'm not sure. It's Mr. Uh, Alderaji's. Oh, I didn't okay. create this. All right. All right. Convoluted. <clears throat> right. Can I answer that question? Come on up. Yes, that's fine. So, um, do you see Bruce is is the back lot behind? If you look at the, the diagram here, you see that Bruce's lot was the back lot of this lot that got split right here. And so, it was learned later 
that the 10,000 square foot lots that Tom Harmon did along the shoreland land was not right. It had to be a 40,000 square foot lot. So all we did was just, we incorporated some of the land here to add to, to Mr. Bruce's, Bruce's plot. So it would become 40,000 square feet. Okay, so you were treating um, these lots as um, contiguous pieces of land that could be taken from one and moved over to the other. And we're family members. We so we can whatever they yeah. We're family members, and we were we decided to we would if if she needed some extra land, of course it makes sense to give it to it because otherwise it would be a useless lot. I understand. Uh huh. However, um, by shuffling these around, you actually created a sold lot, lot A, lot B, lot C. Lot E and another sold lot. So you have created one, two, three, four, five, six lots. I have not created six lots. The three of us created one lot apiece. See. How come the names on the um, on the top? Three are different on each of these. Because I made an error when I said that um, Bruce um, was the original purchaser uh, from Pellegrino when it was my mother. So I, I was in an error. It was Bruce, and then you can see I moved Bruce down because I learned that Bruce was actually the second owner, so I moved his name down to the bottom square, the second square. Okay, so this one is not correct. No, that's a re Correct. no. That one's old. It, 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 I found some errors as I was looking at it. I realized the dates were wrong, and so I wanted to make sure it was as accurate as possible when I came here. So I revised it. Okay. And this is all verifiable. Um, I'm not sure. Um, um, I guess I'm still wondering, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, we have a total of out of these three lots that are wiggled and waggled together and changed around because they're family. Um, so they're, to me, they're considered one lot. Only one lot happened that way. What? Only Bruce's lot happened that way. All the other lots were separate. If you look at the plans right now, you'll see that um, in the plan, it's dashed. There's a dashed line that shows the original three lots. Uh, this would be the original one lot here. The other dashed line is right here. You can see that was the second. And then the third is the bigger piece down here. So those dashed lines actually show you where the original lot, so you can see most of everything is within its own self, except we had to do uh, that, that change to Bruce's again because the 10,000 square foot changed to 40,000 square foot. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to do that. And it was, so it was just a, a, a fix, if you will. But it wasn't like we were moving things around and shuffling things all around and changing things back and forth. This board has to figure out when these divisions happened and if we've done it in accordance with the regulations. And when I've got book and page numbers with no dates on there to tell me when that happened, and, and I'm not entirely sure that you can split a lot to the same person and call that a legal split. I mean, by definition, if it's, if you got I own a piece of property uh, on Carolyn Drive, and in, over the course of time, we've added pieces to it. it. It's considered a contiguous lot now. I don't get I don't get tax on all the separate yeah. parcels and pieces. I get the tax on the whole piece. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm really at, at a loss as to how I'm supposed to determine. Now I'll go rate number two. You. You split a lot. There's no dates on when you split that lot. And no, I said I did not split number two. Remember, I said we kept it within ourselves that I was going to build my home on that. So I'm not contending that that lot has been split. I'm not saying that lot has split. I even said to you that we did not. We kept it within our own name because I'm putting my house on that lot. It doesn't matter which of these flow charts I look at. On if I go number two straight down, it split either to Joyce. Al Girardi twice, or it's split to A and A Al Girardi twice. Yeah. 
the I, same parcel of land, the same owners. I'm not saying I split that. I'm not trying to appeal to say that I split those two up. That's not what the appeal is here for. I already agree with you that that has not been split up and therefore it is one piece of land right there. That's not the argument. I, I, that's fine. You can leave it as one lot right there. That's fine. My argument is that I'm being told that something I was asked to do is the violation and, and why I'm being held for here today is that I, and, and that I'm required now to go back to the drawing board and start all over again after 15 years of, of the owning this property. I understand where your concern is, but I think the question is, gets back to if there was no re record of these lots anywhere. They're, they're all in New York Registry Deeds. You don't have any dates on there. You don't have I'll, any I'll, dates on these the, the to tell me when. The date doesn't exist. It's because I, I didn't write a date sir, on there. It makes no difference whether it exists or not. In front of this board, it doesn't exist because there's no date on there. I, I can't, how, I'm supposed to determine when things got broken up. And if I can't, you can't tell me when these things got divided up. How am I supposed to make a determination if you did it if they're in accordance with well, then, state uh, law? Then give me a recess of 10 minutes then. I'll come back with the four days for you. I got to go to the bathroom anyway. How about that? Does that work for you? You, you can do what you need to do. Well, I mean, um, I can look up. It, it takes two minutes. I, it takes no time at all to get those dates. I can do it right now. I'll let Jen, she had a comment okay. anyway. Maybe you can ask uh, Mr. Alderaji how Douglas Bruce Brady comes into all these deeds. He is not listed on the flow chart at all. On, on the one he gave you guys. Hmm? Brady, he's, not, he's on ours. He's not, he's not on mine. But, yeah, okay, right. Yeah. Yep. No. <clears throat> Well, where is yours, Jen? <laughs> is that the one that was this given one. to you? Remember? Yeah, no. So he leaves out on the registry yeah. of deeds. Mr. Chairman, I can think I talk her now? I think it's important that yeah. we have an application okay. video what you have to say. Yeah, so I think you're right. Respond if necessary. Yeah, the same number. Exactly. Where all these have different numbers. Right. Except these. Well, two. he's saying that. I guess that's just one lot now. So. Well, it's different now. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes. You need to refrain. Okay. I think we're fine. At this time, um, yes. Well, just to, let's um. I'll let you say one thing, then I'll let Jen say something. Well, just before I look up the dates, I just want to say that, you know, I'm here to prove that I never split a lot up more than twice to go to the planning board. I only proven here that I've only split it once. The date or no date, that proves that. I never split anything three times. Those deeds, even though there's no date on it, are legal. I, I, I understand what you're trying to, you're telling me. Jen, did you have something that you wanted to say? Yeah. So if you pull up some of these deeds on the Register of Deeds, York County Deeds, and you can do it, you know, um, 
where it is conveyed to Bruce Brady in that um, number one, sorry, number one, um, Bruce Brady, book 16412, page 184. It's actually not just conveyed to Bruce Brady, Douglas Bruce Brady. It's actually conveyed. I'm sorry. Um, I just couldn't hear it. Okay. So if you if you pull up the deed listed under number one, his flow chart, book 16412, page 184. It's not conveyed to Bruce Brady. It's actually conveyed to Adnan Alderaji and Bruce Brady. So there's missing like information on this flow chart um, that would be relevant to some of these splits, I think. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I'm just gonna oh, step oh. outside. I just need some air. So you can continue. I'm just gonna stand right over here for a minute. Um, I think if the town attorney would like to speak and help give us a little direction here, it may help because I think I'm kind of struggling right now. Sure. Um, of course, any factual determination is entirely up to this board. Um, but what I can do is set the stage for the legal considerations that you need to be thinking about. So we already went through, and I'm not going to redefine, you know, what a definition of subdivision is, what a track or parcel is. Um, what I have heard said by Mr. al Duraji and also um, Jen McCabe had addressed this really important issue, and I haven't heard this board talk about it and ask questions about it, and I don't want it to be lost because I think it is really important, is that initial division from the Pellegrinos <coughs> to um, Mr. al Duraji and various family members. So the, that those lots one, two, and three in 2007. I absolutely understand and even sympathize with what Mr. Eldaraji is saying is that, hey, I didn't do that. That's not my fault. I just inherited it. But under Maine law, it's fairly clear that as a purchaser, or not just purchaser, anybody who becomes a predecessor in title or successor in title, I should mm -hmm. say, inherits the sins of the past. Yep. For, that's not a legal term, but it's just trying to make you understand that just because they weren't responsible for the problem does not mean they don't inherit it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to understand and do the analysis whether that first division in 2007 into those three separate lots constituted a subdivision that should have been reviewed by the planning board. Mm -hmm. If you find that, um, then I think it's also important to understand that all of those subsequent conveyances and divisions Remember. were tainted <coughs> by mm -hmm. that. And it, w this board is not here to solve that problem. This board is not here to say, and I, and again, I, I often, not only is this my day and night job, I sit on a board of appeals in my own town, so I understand the job. It's hard, right? You're not here to solve that problem. I understand that there are folks out there who have purchased these lots that are not family members, and one might think, oh shoot, what happens to them? Not your problem. Okay. Um, but I do think you need to analyze the legal significance of that first out conveyance by the Pellegrinos of those three lots. And, um, you know, that is the first point of analysis. And then I think the second point, and then we have, again, I'm looking at either, either of these flowcharts, regardless, right? You've got the first the first line and then kind of the, the filling of the sandwich, so to speak, what happened in between. And then the fact that now you have four lots that are essentially in common ownership and what the implications are, are there. From a legal perspective, I think it's important, as I say, what is the implication of that first division? And then second, now that they are all in common ownership, you have to analyze, is that a tractor parcel? Look at that definition and determine um, you know, if they want to convey those portions out, if they can do that or if they are required to get subdivision approval. So those, to me, that's the legal analysis that needs to be done. I know it's confusing, so if I can clarify that in any way, please ask questions that you may have. Mr. Chairman, I just have yes. a question. Um, <clears throat> I heard what you said. My understanding that this board is to determine whether or not the appellant has made a case for a mistake. Correct. And so, to me, it's I, I just need the simple, the simple question is, uh, <coughs> has there been enough evidence 
submitted to me as to whether or not the, there was an administrative mistake by an officer of the town. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, your, your job is twofold, right? Because, and, I, and I'm assuming, and you know what they say about assuming, I shouldn't do that. But I am asking whether you would like, would the board would like me to draft the findings in, in this matter. Um, I'm, I, I've been taking notes, copious ones, so that I can do that if you would like me to do so. But, but to your point, there are two parts to any decision these board makes, right? Findings of fact, evidence, conclusions of law. And so in the end, your decision is to dovetail the, the important pieces is that you take the evidence, you put it within the legal framework, and that is how you decide whether or not to grant or deny the appeal based on whether the code enforcement officer has erred, right? So it is that kind of, what are the facts? What is the legal requirement? How do they go together? And so, yes, you're quite right that the evidence is really important, but we also have to understand what the legal issues are and knit them together. I'm going to ask one more clarifying question. Um, in 2007, when the lots were split, um, why, what was done wrong for that, when that split was mm -hmm. done, why did it become a subdivision? Sure. I guess. Okay. Is that the right question I yeah, want? Yeah, and if you're asking me, again, that's your analysis, but I can tell you what my thoughts are around that regarding, and just opining on what the legal definition is. Right. Okay, so I don't have those deeds. I haven't looked at those deeds, okay? But let's assume that there was one, I'll call it the mother parcel, one mother single parcel. Pellegrino's lot. That Pellegrino's mm -hmm. had, that's what they had. And then they out conveyed those three lots to three separate individuals. Mm -hmm. When I say separate individuals, meaning they were not in common ownership. You've got um, uh, Mr. Aldaraji, you've got yeah. Joyce, I believe, and then you have both. So that that is not common ownership. Those are three separate and distinctly owned parcels. Mm -hmm. Because, again, going back to the definition of what a subdivision is, that first division. That's okay. Yep. You can do that. The second one was... The second oh, one God. is what triggered, it, if you're asking me, if I'm looking at that law, that could be said to have triggered the definition of subdivision. The <coughs> next piece of analysis, okay, so great. You've got a subdivision. Who cares? Why is that relevant? Wasn't approved. Well, <laughs> because the, sec, the, the subdivision law under 4406 and your own subdivision regs say once you have a subdivision then that must be essentially reviewed and blessed by a planning board. And in that process, the reason you do that is to make sure that, you know, the criteria under subdivision, we don't need to go into that, but more like, okay, is it, is the, are the roads big enough? Is there enough frontage? Is the soil erosion okay? Is there, is there subsurface? Is that appropriate? So that's why. Right? But the answer to the question of, and it's your analysis to do, you need to figure out and, and, and weigh in on whether did that, whether that initial conveyance in 2007 was a subdivision. If so, then it's not a tough question. If it was, then it should have been reviewed by the planning board. And that is the question. Um, <coughs> There's one other piece that comes up in this and, and I'm having a little bit of a struggle with it but I think I'm understanding but I, I want to clarify you can if you own the property and you stay in the property you can actually break it into three parcels and it's not required to be a subdivision is that so true? that yes but, and as we talked about um, before I said there's a laundry list, quite a few exceptions mm -hmm. to that definition. Sounds One of here. which is that I think what you're referring to is a homestead exemption, meaning I'm staying there. I, I, I stay there. Um, I'm not sure what the evidence is on that. There, it hasn't been before you. Um, but let's just say hypothetically that Pellegrino said, you know what, I'm going to divide this. I'm going to stay on this lot for five years, ten years, whatever, whatever that requirement is. That's an exception, right? If another one. Again, this is just to get, I'm not saying this this happened, I'm just giving you examples. This case. If examples. there was a divorce and by court order, you know, the parties wanted to divide that up and, and the court would say, you know what, 
in the divorce, that often happens in a divorce decree. They separate, not that anybody, exes necessarily want to live next to each other, but they mm -hmm. might divide that property. And the court would say, exemption. hey, that's not a, or if um, I die and my estate is conveying it, or if I'm conveying it to family members, you know. Um, but I don't think the evidence is in that any of those exceptions apply here. Maybe, maybe, maybe it does, but I didn't hear evidence to suggest that it does. Quick question. Yes. Uh, when you explained that if uh, if the subdivision is uh, the rules are such that it should tr should have triggered mm -hmm. a review by the planning board, mm -hmm. okay? Would that would that uh, would that correlate with uh, the letter that said something to the effect of that it was the evidence was or the, the testimony was that uh, that it had to start all over again. Is, is, are those, is there a connection there? Yeah, I, I don't know if it said, I don't know actually, let me look at, at the letter. I'm not sure it said you have to start all over again. I think that was Mr. Eldaraji's um, interpretation. But what <coughs> I am saying is, is that this, if you find that that original 2007 um, lot split required subdivision approval, you can't cure the original sin, so to speak, right. yeah, the, the, uh, by subsequent yeah. conveyances. And this is a tree with no trunk. Cor correct. When yes. You put it up and what, what I, you know, I think <coughs> that, you know, assuming that, that either of these two flowcharts are correct, mm -hmm. that I think the evidence does suggest that Mr. Daraji or his family members did not divide, did not subsequently mm -hmm. subdivide these mm -hmm. parcels. But that is not necessarily the issue. The issue is what happened, what he inherited. Right. <coughs> and, and, and I know that, you know, I'm looking at that, the appeal, the administrative appeal, and number one, the first statement is we are not responsible for the Pellegrino division into, th into three lots. And that is true. You aren't responsible. They are not uh, responsible for th the it. division. Right. True, but they mm -hmm. are responsible for the implications mm -hmm. of that under main law. They are responsible for what? The implications yes, of okay. that, meaning that, Probably. for example, and I'm, I'm just using a totally separate example. Mm -hmm. Say I, I purchased a lot from somebody, and it's sitting on, and the shed there didn't, doesn't meet setbacks. Just because I didn't plunk that shed in the wrong place doesn't mean that the code enforcement officer can't say, hey, new owner of property, there's a violation on your property. So violations run with the land. They do not run with the owner, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's still broken when you sell it to the next person. What? It's still broken when you sell it to the next person. Mm -hmm. <coughs> El Jaraji, would you like to speak to the, the first split? Uh, well, I mean, I think it was said, uh, you know, if, it's a big word here, if the Pellegrinos did it incorrectly, mm -hmm. how are we to know? How, how are we to know and whose responsibility is to find that out? And if you do find out it was done wrong, what is repercussions? What, what, who has to do what at that point? Well, in your flowchart, clearly you've got three separate names on three parcels of yes. land yes. that came from yeah, the Pellegrino. So there was sir. there was a division right there hey. that happened. Yeah, you guys say to yourself, sir, that um, within that homestead law, if you stay within the place for five years, the Mr. Pellegrino owned that place for thirty years. So I'm sure that civil consultants must have looked at all the criteria. Uh, before doing so again not my not my bag that's not my responsibility I don't know what, what the criteria was that they looked at but you know being that he's member of the you know pretty well-known engineer in Maine um, well it'd be, it'd be a pretty major mistake don't know if you can speak for well, civil well, consultants that's my opinion that's just my opinion I feel they're a good I engineering just, group you know so we in the records we show that Pellegrinos owned a one parcel of land mm -hmm. and now 
we have three parcels of land that were split up. Mm -hmm. We need to know, the, the town says, we need to know how those lots were split up. I mean, were, was it done appropriately? I mean, you were the one that bought the pieces of land. That's right, I bought them in good faith. <clears throat> But you need so Ms. Brown, there's uh, you can go back into the records and there's there was no ever planning board approval for this initial split from Pellegrino to what no. Chen right you wonder there's no record of it right or is there it's lost but never received subdivision review ever okay so so it was seemingly illegally sold in three different lots that's correct okay has, has, Jen, has um, is there ever gone to the planning board no and he was told to by James who is our town planner at the time I have been by the planning board I went all the way to you want to step up not for the original three lot split. Well, that was all part of it. This is, uh, the whole the whole start of this was um, to do a subdivision um, through the planning board, uh, which we tried uh, diligently to do, and we got through all the way through the preliminary stage with with just a final um, stage left, and we were all approved by the planning board. And the reason why I didn't get to the final is because two reasons: one, it was two thousand eight. And so that hit hard with the economic uh, disaster. And two, um, the Berwick Sewer District could not come up with um, a way that they wanted to bring the sewer up. Uh, they were having a hard time. Should it be a pump? Should we be allowed to do a single pump? Or should it be one big main station in the center of the cul-de-sac? And so they could not come up with an answer. And I believe civil consultants and the planning board, we all met together to try to figure out how that would be. And that never happened, so um, it, it, got, it got tabled because of the economy at, at the same time. And so it was tabled all the way to 2021, where I then came back to Jay Wheeler at the Berwick uh, Sewer District and asked him if, uh, what, what the system was, and, and at that time he still didn't know. And so I believe that he went in front of the board and came up with a, a solution for the sewer district uh, to, that, that they would be happy with and how to get the sewer up uh, into the street. Um, so that's that's uh, that's what I know about that. I'm not going to speak for Jay Wheeler here. I'm going to speak on behalf of the town. And subdivision approval comes in front of the planning board several times a year. And it's never been an issue before to figure out how to get sewer down to a road that should be on town sewer. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask a clarifying question? Yes. Um, and it's for both parties. I understand that Mr. Al Jaraji said, well, we need to, we were trying to figure out how to get town sewer up or town water up to those parcels. But, and again, this is my ignorance of the town, but isn't the case that not the whole town is on sept uh, town water and <laughs> sewer? So in those cases, isn't it possible that any development could get do a subsurface septic system as long as it met with the plumbing code and the subsurface rules. I'll speak to that. That's a matter of lot size. So for different districts here in the town of Berwick, depending if you live on the R1, R2, or R3 zone, um, to be on town sewer and water in the R1 district, which is our road, Merriam Street. Um, you only need 10,000 square feet per lot. To be on septics, I believe, I don't have it in front of me, it's it's rare that it's septics, but, do you have your land use ordinance? Can I just see that real quick? I'm pretty sure it's double. I just wanna make sure that I say it clearly here. While you're looking for that, um, but but is it, it is it the case though that 
I understand that the minimum lot size is, is substantially different, but just because there isn't sewer or public sewer and water doesn't mean you can't build. You just have to install a septic system. Yeah, I'd be interested to um, have Mr. Alderaji show a couple of different plans that might have come through at that time and to see if he wanted to downgrade his, I mean, upgrade his subdivision to more lots. Um, I don't have anything in writing, but I do believe when he first approached James and I, um, and he can speak better to it, maybe maybe not, but I'm almost positive that um, he came with less lots and he wanted us to help him add lots. And we were happy to do so if he had the proper um, dimensional requirement to do so. Um, to go on uh, public sewer and water in the R1 zone, it's 10,000 square feet per lot. To go on septic system in the R1 zone, it is 20,000 square feet per lot that's needed. So essentially, if, if, what, if sewer and water wasn't available, you, if you wanted to make a buildable lot in that area, you'd have to double the lot size Correct. To, to be able to accept the septic and the, and the, uh, and yeah. the well. Okay. Did that help? Yeah, and I didn't mean to go off on no, a no. tangent. I just, uh, I just wanted to understand that. Okay, um, I guess I can now see this, Jen. Um, so maybe I should ask Mr. Eldridge. These. Do you want to just ask us both? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have we have these four lots now, four contiguous lots, same owner. Okay, in these lots, are you now? Um, and this is as of 2021 that these became uh, needed. Became a, a they were registered at the Registry of Deeds in 2021. Okay, so yep. this, this is the first time that this that this uh, parcel of land now has um, four lots with um, the same name. So it's a contiguous lot now. Whereas before, when it was the three of you, it, it was three separate people. Now it's one contiguous piece of land. And you're trying now, what you, what, and if that's true, then according to the subdivision regulations, um, you know, if you have this contiguous lot, then if you want to divide any of that land up now, you have to, um, it's a subdivision if you do three lots in a five-year period. Is that correct? Yes. Right, but if they all came from three different individuals, then they're not over three lots. It's one lot, two lots, which we haven't even divided yet, and then the third one. So they're coming from three different ownerships, so therefore they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. Are you? Make sense? I'm, I'm a little confused, like, um, well. Pat, I yeah. think the best is maybe to um, rely on the attorney to kind of explain it for you okay. a little bit um, better. One of the things I'm puzzled about now is you might know are, are you interested, you know, if, if he wants to subdivide this land now, mm -hmm. then, you know, he, had, he has a starting date of 2021 when these four people own this together. And so, I, is that what it means when you say the clock is starting to tick again? I'm not sure he is your who's your question yeah. to. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I should I was be directing that. it to mm -hmm. you. Why don't we ask? I would ask the attorney. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think what I'm going to try to do out of an absolute abundance of fairness, because I think it's really important to give everybody their their mm -hmm. their due, right? Is I'm going to try to distill down what each side's argument is and then talk about what the law is okay, okay? when I have and, and again I'm sure the parties will correct me and jump up after I'm done to, 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 to take exception to what I have how I characterize their arguments okay so my first task is to characterize each side and then after that to talk about what I think the law says okay is that is that a fair way to approach this mm -hmm. 
Okay. So what I believe Mr. Eldaraji's position is, is that because that original three lot division from Pellegrino, mm -hmm. he had nothing to do with that, that wasn't his fault, had the Pellegrinos, should they have gone to the planning board? Maybe they should have, but he didn't do it, so therefore it's not his fault. I think as I ex explained to you, I, I, I believe that that is a legally incorrect position, okay? Um, I think what he is saying is, so, so that's the first thing that happened. Then we get down to the bottom of the chart where you've got, I think what you were referencing was the four um, lots that are now in common ownership, right? And so under the definition of tractor parcel and subdivision, if they are all in that common ownership, then they do have to, that basically would set the clock back, as Mr. Eldaraji says, is that now that it's swept back into common ownership, in order to convey any of those parcels out, or I should say three, right? If he was going to, right. uh, not, not four, but three, then that would trigger subdivision review. But based on this plan that we have and the flow chart where we see four in common ownership, that, in my view, meets the definition of subdivision, okay? I think what his position is, is that it doesn't matter because these were all separate lots beforehand and they haven't changed, and maybe I'm wrong, what he is saying is the four at the bottom have not changed configuration from the, from the lines above them. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Okay. So, what he is, so, so let me just broaden the lines here for a second. Leave this aside and I'll give you a, a hypothetical example, okay? Say that these four, say, say there are four lots that in 2000, an applicant comes to the planning board and gets subdivision approval for four lot subdivision, okay? Mm -hmm. They do that. And then, after getting that approval, they convey out to the same person. So I, Leah Rachin, buy four lots, not Leah Rachin and Owen, my son, just Leah Rachin. I buy four lots that are contiguous and they're right next to each other. That is not a track or common, is not a track or parcel anymore in common ownership because they've already received planning board approval as separate lots. Okay, that's the critical factor. I think it's important to understand. Once the once a planning board has blessed those lots and say this plan was actually approved by the sub the, by the planning board, then once those are approved, that's a subdivision and one person can buy every single darn lot in that subdivision and that doesn't make it back to one tractor parcel because once it's been approved each one of those things are a lot of record and they're Named blessed and they're legal, okay? <laughs> the issue here is, as I interpret it, is that that original division of three lots was not blessed, was not reviewed, was not approved. And so therefore, all of the subsequent conveyances were tainted. Once they, and they were not separate lots of record, right? They weren't blessed. I mean, I shouldn't say that. They were lots of record in the fact that they were recorded in the registry, but they constituted illegal lots because they were not granted subdivision approval. So you get, oh, now back to my plan. Now that, because you get down here, had these four lots been approved and they were now in common ownership, it wouldn't matter, that would be okay. But because, as I say, jokingly, but not really, original sin, anything that happened subsequently was not legal. And I'm not saying that's fair or, or right and it's unfortunate, but it is my belief that under Maine law, whoever takes those subsequent conveyances is subject to the problem, Care it inherits the problem, so to speak. <clears throat> kind of think this is like our <clears throat> remember the end remember the um, appeal that was signed by the wrong person filling in and it was all maintaining it's kind of where we're at here is that this initial one wasn't legitimate therefore everything after it's not legitimate so she can't approve any divisions or doing anything with anything down here nothing can be approved past the, past the very top she can't approve any of it because none of it's legitimate 
All the town is seeking is so. for Mr. Alderaji to come and get blessed by the planning board for his <coughs> lots and move on with the subdivision. Right. <coughs> so, it, it, I feel for you. I understand. Right. You got. It, right. Yes, not be <coughs> discussing it with him per se. I think. Yeah. I, I feel for the appealee for what happened. Getting this illegitimate three, three lots, but you're stuck with it now, kind of, you know, is the, is the way to put it. You're stuck with it now, and you have to deal with what you have now. It sounds like you have to backpedal a ways. And go from, go from there. Mr. Chairman. <coughs> yes. Uh, I just would like to, whoever would want to answer the question or, or speak to it, I should say, is I'm still at the point where I'm saying my job here is to uh, deal with the appellant's claim. And the appellant is saying a mistake was made, an administrative <coughs> error was made, and therefore we should, uh, you know, act accordingly. But I haven't seen the Currently, I haven't seen the evidence that a mistake was made, so I would appreciate some input that hasn't already been made that would indicate whether or not a mistake was made or not. In addition, and it's and it sort of a corollary to, to this, is that that original letter that the appellant uh, wrote with 11 points on it, there were some serious accusations. They were talking about uh, being discriminated against, etc. There was a lot on that that 11 point letter. And that bothers me because we don't have any jurisdiction on any of those kinds of accusations because to me that would be uh, some kind of a law or a court, you know, the Superior Court or some court that would not be the planning board. But that kind of evidence uh, that was presented to us still weighs in my head. So I'm wondering, and I haven't heard any other evidence that would that maybe, uh, that the code enforcement officer made a mistake in that letter. But the background of all of these accusations, uh, it weighs in my mind. Mr. Chairman, I can address if you'd like me to just the, the, the situation with the discrimination and the bias and those allegations if you want me to talk about what, if any, role this board has in, in hearing, well, you've heard it, but, but weighing in on that. I'm happy to discuss that. If not, I'm happy to be quiet. I hesitate to even get into that, but at the same time, I think we're a young board and we're trying to learn, so I think it probably would be beneficial. Okay. So here's what I would say to that. And it kind of gets back to the appellate versus de novo yeah. standard of review. And I know like I'm throwing out Latin words, but they're actually important for this particular reason, okay? Afresh. So if it was appellate, you're just looking at the record that was in front of the decision maker here, the code officer, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it were just appellate review, I think the state of mind and bias and alleged bias would be really important, okay? And not that not that those allegations aren't important. I'm not minimizing them in any way, right? Of course, everybody should have a fair shot at, at having a decision that's that's unbiased. Um, you've heard testimony from a code enforcement officer in that regard responding to that. But frankly, because as we talked about, your role is de novo, meaning fresh, tabula rasa, from the beginning, you're not giving, and not that I'm saying she's not entitled to it, but you're not giving any deference to the code officer's decision because your ordinance tells you not to do so, right? You are taking new evidence. If you look at the procedure, it's clear you're taking new evidence, you're hearing oral testimony, cross-examination is allowed. So your role is to look at this from scratch. And so even if, and I'm not saying this is the case, but let's assume that the code officer or some decision maker was extremely biased. 
it, it doesn't necessarily matter because you're looking at this from scratch, right? So what would be actually problematic if somebody was alleging that any board member had bias, right? That is because you essentially are sitting as the judge and jury, right. and that, as the decision maker, it's important that you be fair and unbiased. Right. But I've not heard any um, allegations that you are not. And so because it's a de novo review, I think those allegations of bias um, are, and again, I'm not minimizing them or saying that those kind of allegations are unimportant, but you're the decision maker now, okay? Um, so it's your bias and your open-mindedness that's, that's critical here. Thank you. Do, does anyone have any more to say as far as the, for the public opportunity to speak? We have in the past, and I believe we'll continue to do that if during our discussions there's a question that comes up, we will ask people to come up and address any questions that we might have. But I think we're actually been kind of in the middle of discussing now, and I'm not sure that was what we should have been doing. But we, I mean, we're a volunteer board. We're trying to do the best we can to to understand the situation and come to a fair decision. So that's why, you know, I've kind of allowed probably more than what should have happened. But if both if feel like you're all set. We'll close the public hearing comment part and go into the discussion phase for the board. You're all set, Ms. McCabe? So um, I just want to bring up the fact that, you know, the bias and the discrimination and harassment, um, I, I, I may not, um, it may not, uh, be your responsibility in that respect and it might not be on you but it does take a toll on the individual um, and I gotta imagine that if you hear something bias or not it's, you're gonna want to favor the employee that you hired here it's it's if it's coming from her you're gonna want to back her up she's your employee she's here to set the rules um, and so it's gonna be hard for me to convince you otherwise. I have emails, I have documentation very thick that shows I've sent many <laughs> emails out with no responses that I've tried to find out what would could be done if we could sit down and have a discussion and meet uh, with no responses. Um, and then one time we do meet and I have a direction to go do something, um, lo and behold, it sets me back 15 years. And so if you can't see the big picture here, then I can't so there's nothing else I can say, but it's pretty clear and obvious that I've been railroaded here for a better lack of uh, lack of a better word. Um, and, and again, if you can't see that big picture, then I can't explain that to you. If the board would like, I'd be happy to speak to those bias because they're just simply not true. <clears throat> okay. I believe that we're here for me to make sure that the subdivision is necessary, your decision is appropriate. Uh, we're working our way through the splits and I think that's what our, our job is here, is to make sure that the everything was followed in accordance with, with, the, with the law that, that, that we're given to decide. So I think at this point in time, we're gonna, if we have any other questions from? Uh, just one second. Uh, I think unless there's some more evidence, as Ernie would say, to the subdivision that we're trying to determine whether it should have been or not should have been a subdivision in accordance with this, the uh, Code of Officers letter, if there's any more evidence we're willing to listen, but if there's no more clarifications on that, I think I'm ready to close. I think on behalf of the town, we're all set. Thank, Thank you. you. All set. 
Okay. So we've heard from Mr. Al Jazari and Ms. McCabe and the lawyer. We've got this in front of us now. Um, I would guess I heard Mr. Cotton talk about the, the split. What is the original split? What is, uh, do we need any more information to determine if it was? Do any of you need any more information on your own minds to understand whether it was a, a, a split that should have been gone to subdivision or not? Is there anything else that's going to help you better understand that? Are you, are you asking if we agree? No, I'm just saying, I, I'm not. We understand. Do, is it, do we need, do you need more information to understand no. what was said and, and what what your feelings are on that particular part of the argument? Yes, Ernie. Um, my answer to that question is I probably don't have any more evidence in terms of, but the, the, there is that one piece that the attorney mentioned, and I know that we have the authority to uh, look at things afresh. And uh, the question is, do we want to look at <coughs> any more information or interview anybody else? Uh, or fact find on our own, uh -huh. which is uh, fresh. Uh, let, let me address that. I, I, I don't want to have misspoken, okay? When I say you look at it afresh, you are looking at what the parties are presenting to you. You do not fact find. You do, you, you, you're basing your decision on what is presented to you by the parties. They have the burden of proof. This board does not go on its own separate fact finding missions, okay? okay. Okay. If, just to be clear, and if I if I misspoke, I do apologize. In that. So, a site review would not be. I realize that this is not, but but site reviews, if if appellate comes to us with you know, something I, else, I would need to look at your powers. I mean, there may be something. I I think just as a matter of course, a lot of ordinances say, hey, if you need to do a site review, you you can order that. Um, but in this case, I would say that looking at the face of, like, the lay of the land or what's happening on the on the face of the earth really isn't what's at issue here. It's whether or not a subdivision was created. Okay. So, again, I am not dissuading you from that if you feel like a site plan visit or site visit is important. But in this case, I'm not sure it's particularly relevant to the issues. Right, right. I agree. Okay. When? Okay. I answered my question. You all set? Um, as far as the the flow chart and the dates, we need any more clarification on where that's going? I do not. Nope. So, if we heard all the information we needed, uh, are we prepared to offer a a finding? Or is that I guess where somewhere I'm headed with this? Uh, You've heard the information. You 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 don't need any further information. We're all set. Okay. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, is there a motion on the table then? Does someone want to make a motion? What do I'd like to make a motion to deny the appeal on the basis that that the original split was illegitimate and she can't approve things further down the line based on that. <clears throat> so we have the motion on the table to deny the appeal, to deny the appeal. based on the split, the, the three split, the lots were split in 2007. I shouldn't. No. Based on this initial split that was not done properly by the prior owners of the property, everything after is not legitimate because of this. So she cannot approve something here when the start was bad. So it's the basis for the denial of the appeal. Okay. 
And, and, and if I might just mm -hmm. amend that motion if I can, and therefore we find that the code enforcement officer did not err That's in so. her May 3rd, 2022 letter, if that yeah. makes sense. No, it absolutely does. So, and therefore, ba based on these, this, this fact here, we find that the code enforcement officer did not make a wrong judgment in denying the application. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. I have a second from Mr. Beach. <clears throat> Is there any further discussion on this issue at this time? We know that there's a motion and a second on the table. Is everyone prepared? I, I, I just want to say that um, for me, uh, you know, there's a all these charts of, of who, who and what, when and how, uh, they're, they're, I'm sure they're relevant to a certain extent, but my, my, my focus is on was there enough evidence <coughs> to convince me that the code enforcement officer made an error, an administrative error. And to be honest with you, I did not hear enough evidence that tells me that an, a, an administrative error was made because to me uh, our job is either to you know work with variances or administrative errors uh, or pass it on to the planning board for other you know other considerations those are the only options that we have we can't get into all of the nuances of, the, of these letters and and charts and so forth because to me uh, I want to get to the core of, of the appellant's uh, appeal. What was the appeal? And he, he was appealing an administrative error, period. And I don't have that, I don't have the clarity of evidence. We all set to vote. So I'm going to ask for a show of hands for all those in favor of the appeal, or in favor of the motion that was made. And the motion so, is denying the Right. The, the, we're going to okay. raise our hands if we agree with the motion and the motion was to deny. Right. Do we have do we have on record as to what our motion is? Yes. I think you have a, a, a yes. recording secretary, yes. correct? Yes, yeah. we do. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> a show of hands is to will essentially deny the appeal. And, and can I make a point of clarification? This is super lawyery, but I, no, I just I want to make sure, make sure. <laughs> that the record is clear. You had taken a, a, a vote earlier to deny the portion of the appeal relating to the septic. Okay. This is denying the appeal relating to the subdivision issue, which is Correct. clear. So I you're gonna to you're going to vote on that. Then I think just to wrap it all up in a neat little bow at the end, I think you want to make a, a formal vote to whether just to grant or deny the appeal, ultimately. Okay. So you'll have two motions, and then we can talk about what's next and procedurally. Okay. okay. So I'm going to ask everyone at this point in time to vote. I got all in favor of the motion. Motion carries. And so I think just to wrap it up, I would say somebody should motion, make a motion to um, deny the appeal. I'm assuming it's a denial based on your prior. Um, findings and just say to, um, move to deny the appeal based on our our prior findings. So we'll, I'd like to make a motion to deny the first trait of the uh, appeal. And so in a whole, both traits of the appeal are denied. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion to vote on that. Second? Second. <clears throat> All those in favor? So, adjourn uh, now, or do you? I, I think before you do that, what I'd like to do is talk about just some procedural things about findings. All okay. right. Um, what I will do is so under the under the appeal provisions of of the state statutes and under your own ordinances is that um, the appellant has the right to appeal um, within 45 days of the vote, okay? Not the written decision. So 
they should govern themselves accordingly because a lot of people believe that it appeal period doesn't start running until you have a written decision, okay? So what I'm going to do is to um, circulate quickly, as quickly as I can, in the next couple of days, um, a written, a draft findings, which you will have to consider yourselves and take up and, and consider. Um, under, and this is something that is, is a bit tricky, um, <laughs> under the state statute, it talks about how, how quickly you have to turn around those decisions, right? Um, and it says that you need to give a written decision. Do I have this in front of me? I believe it's 10 days from the actual vote. I could be wrong there. But what I think is important is, here we are, notice of decision must be mailed within seven days of the board's decision, okay? So what is important is that you review these findings to make sure that they are consistent with, you know, I mean, I'm gonna draft them. Right. My hope is that, that they are consistent with your findings and your deliberations, but it's important that you exercise your independent judgment and make sure that they're appropriate. So sure. what I would <coughs> suggest is that you meet within that seven day period and authorize the chair to sign it. Um, so that's that's my recommendation, but I will get these to you in the next couple of days. But just for the um, Mr. El Duraji's benefit, it's important to understand when the clock starts ticking in the event that he wants to bring an appeal. Appeal the appeal. Correct. And Excellent. as part of <coughs> any findings and conclusions that I will draft you, it will have um, the notice of appeal rights on it right there, so that that will guide the the um, the applicant and what what's next if in fact they decide to move forward. So. Let's, assuming uh, that this comes quite quickly, uh, is there the suggestions within the seven days? What time do we want to meet? We should pick a time while we're here that's convenient so that we're not trying to track people down. I'm pretty well open. Is <coughs> thank you. Thank you, um, Tammy. Is there a day that's better for you? Monday. Monday right now there's a meeting from Vision Berwick, so we could always meet upstairs and have it video. She can move a camera possibly upstairs at the town hall or possibly Tuesday. Monday right now looks better than Tuesday. Monday? And that's or just that a notice. Be? That should be just a, a, a obviously a public meeting that's noticed. Right. Um, Correct. Yeah, we'll do an agenda and get it published the way we normally do. Great. What's that date? What's the date? It's 7? Monday's the 18th. The 7th day. We okay? Would be next Wednesday. That's fine. All right. So let's plan on meeting at 6.30 on Monday. What do you want? 6 o'clock. 6 is good. What? I'm good with 6. She asked if we want 6. You okay with 6? Yeah, it's fine. 6 is fine. I cannot meet. I cannot meet that. That early? Time. It can be the day, but not the time. Six thirty? No, I can't be from six to eight o'clock. I have another commitment. You can. So Monday's off the table for right. I mean, you know. Well, no. You'll still have a quorum because there will be still four right. of you. Okay. Right. If all, if mm -hmm. the other four can make it, you'll still have a quorum. Okay. So six o'clock on Monday. Yep, and we'll get that notice out. The eighteenth. And, and, and just a procedural thing, usually I, I draft them that the chair will sign, but you will, at the end, you will vote to adopt the findings as amended, assuming that, you know, you're making changes, and that you will second mo part of that motion in to authorize the chair to sign on the board's behalf. Tammy's writing it right down so that we, <laughs> we get it exactly the way we need to. So basically you're making us minutes, basically it's minutes. What's that? It's minutes. No, she's, she's going to find the finding the fact. I'm do, drafting the, the findings. We'll also, we'll also have the minutes available Monday night, too. Mm -hmm. Might as well do a at that time. Okay. So are we all Thank set? Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I guess, I, was I supposed to hit this to start? We'll adjourn.
Do we need a motion to adjourn? Yeah, I didn't see a motion. We need a motion to adjourn. Let's have a motion to adjourn. Okay, motion to adjourn. One second. Second, we got a third. All right. All I will favor. say in my career, I've never seen that one be anything but unanimous, that motion. <laughs> 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 I don't